Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the 11 o'clock block here on a given Thursday. And we're talking about coronavirus. coronavirus. What's next uh, with uh, Winston Welsh, uh, Cynthia Sinclair, Tim Apicella, Stephanie Dalton. Um, and we have, um, we have a very important point to make. That's why we call the show Lots of Shiny Objects, but No Soap on COVID. Um, so Winston, what's your interpretation of that? What are we supposed to talk about here? You know, it's it's almost it's it's true as as Jim was saying earlier that before our show that yesterday COVID's not even coming up anymore because there's so much other noise out there about the election about cheating the Russians, uh, you know, Steve Bannon, whatever. That this has just become sidelined in Hawaii. I think it's become a little bit louder because we had this this sort of weird scandalous corruption of where did the, our fifty million dollars go that we got for testing and for monitoring and, and tracking and all of that. And that and the oversight committees that really haven't been oversighting, they've been doing what they say is great, but the results are we've had an explosion in this state that is not going anywhere but up and out. And uh, so for me, uh, it, it's the state that's more important right now because we had zero cases and we could have controlled this thing and become New Zealand. And now we are going towards the new New York. Yeah. So Cynthia, what, where does it fit in the priority scale, honestly? We have the Democratic Convention, that's important. What's going on with the post office, that's important. Um, we have Steve uh, uh, Bannon, he's, he's creating a lot of news with his $5 million bail. Um, <clears throat> uh, what's, what is, where does COVID fit on the list of priorities right now? Well, I heard Dr. Fauci um, being interviewed this morning on CNN and, and he is concerned about that very same thing. Um, he needs, we need people to be constantly aware of this, especially when we're sending our kids back to school. You know, we've had these great statistics for kids not really getting it and not getting it badly. We got to remember that the first thing we did when all this started was take our kids home, get them out of school and bring them home where they're safe. So they weren't exposed. So we really don't know how it's going to affect kids. And so to just, you know, send them back to school to me is so dangerous. And we know that everything is on the rise everywhere. Here in Hawaii, we had what? We have 5,000 cases now and 40 deaths just over the last month. It's gone up so high. We have two to 300 a day. And then we have over a thousand people a day dying in this country. That, just it's, more, it's more than that, Cynthia. It's, it's over 1,500. Yeah. Oh, man. See, so it's 175,000 people that have died. That's just a huge number that I'm afraid people have become desensitized to. And so they don't really, it doesn't affect them anymore. And even for me, I used to cry at every death. Every new 10, you know, number 10 of deaths that happened, I would just cry way back when it was only a couple thousand people that had died, I was just crying over the fact that a couple thousand people had died. And now it's almost 200,000 people. That's, it's almost more than I can handle to cry about even because it's so overwhelming. And I'm sure that a lot of other people feel the same way that I do. Stephanie, she talked about education. You like education. Where are, where are we in education? <clears throat> Who's well, doing what and what is the right answer? Well, there is a right answer because one country has um, no COVID cases out of its schools and all the kids are in school and they've been there for five months. Okay, so this, this um, is being publicized because I know it, but um, I don't understand why it's not being referred to. For instance, um, uh, the, the country um, happens to be the Viking place, okay? It's Denmark. And they did not, they, their kids are in school. They do not wear masks. They do not take temperatures. What they have done is they have expanded their spaces, okay? Cost a little money. They had to get manpower once they figured out what they were gonna do so that they can have the kids broken down into smaller groups. So they've got them in these little cohorts. Um, I think they're maybe from five or not too many more than five. 
and they're using every space they possibly can and they keep them together. So um, the, the kids are somewhat um, egg crated in these different cohorts all day on the regular schedule, doing the regular things. And what their intervention is in the case of an infection is immediately remove the child and have definite criteria for what that infection is. If it's a temperature, then people go to coffee or whatever. Then they take them immediately out and then they work with the parents. There's tremendous transparency in all the plans and policies that they have. They're constantly in touch on this and the kid goes out okay. and then there isn't- Tim, would you do that here? I want to do that. I want well, to- Tim, I, I don't Tim. Want, oh, I'm sorry, Tim, you, yeah. Tim, would well, you do I, 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 The answer is yes. I, I think it's the only responsible thing to do. And, 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 and I think parents are going to resent the fact that their children through a political agenda is being used as a, a political pawn to get their kids in school when the schools aren't safe yet. And I, I know the teachers aren't very happy about it as well. So yeah, I, I, I agree with Stephanie wholeheartedly. Well, let me, let me uh, go to another question for you. And that is, you know, Trump has been saying we're, we're, we're doing really well. I think that's just, we're doing really well on COVID. And, and, and it always, uh, it, it just goes over my head when he says that. What are we, what is the national government doing? Can you identify what it is doing on COVID? Well, I could identify what it's not doing much easier. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, but I'll just use the quote, lies, damn lies, and the people that tell them. Donald Trump has been saying, we're getting through this. We're doing better than anyone else in the country and anyone else in the world. And we've got this thing all locked down. And you know, he's been lying. It's one of the 20,000 lies that he logs up, uh, you know, since his presidency. Um, yeah, who, who would believe Donald Trump on anything when it comes to COVID? Because he's lied, you know, so magnificently lied. So what has the government done? Um, you know, the best thing the government has done is uh, Dr. Fauci. That's the best thing the government's done is bring him out. Unfortunately, they've muzzled him <laughs> along with Dr. Bricks. And um, it's, it's a political game. It's a political show. Just so Donald Trump, as always, uh, it wants to ensure his election. All things go through that filter. Donald Trump's going to be reelected, and how we look at COVID, how we treat COVID, is through that through that lens, through that filter. You know, you know, uh, Winston. Uh, we talk about shiny objects, and um, you know, we we certainly have a lot of that. I mean, today uh, Trump is uh, tweeting up a storm about the Democratic National Convention, criticizing. Uh, everything and anything that anybody said at the DNC. Um, and, you know, we, we have so many things that he's doing and none of them uh, relate to COVID. It's, um, you know, and people say, and the newscasters are saying, uh, well, he's distracting us. The real news is, is COVID. Do you, do you think this is an intentional thing on his part or is he actually interested in all these other things? What does he have to gain by by uh, trumping up COVID and the Trump response to COVID. Nothing, because there's no response that we can discern. I mean, whatever it is, I don't know. I, I don't feel like there's any response that's meaningful at this point. Uh, I, I did see that they are bringing back the CDC to count uh, numbers again uh, for, for infections and that sort of thing. Uh, they say versus, why? Uh, uh, Probably just because who knows the intern that was counting the White House uh, resigned. So I, I I don't know why they decided to do that, but um, I just saw it pop up in my, in my news feed. So that's some tiny bit of good news, but again, the credibility of our basic institutions has been called into play. So what does it matter that the CDC is is in charge again, or that Deborah Burks, who's uh, I mean she came out and said that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't see really any any coherent federal response at all. What we need, and when we're if we're talking about getting kids back at school or keeping them at home or whatever, we need a comprehensive, coherent, logical response to this. We need financial support for people that have been thrown out of work. We need a rent moratorium, a eviction moratorium. And those people that also are the landlords, they need their mortgages guaranteed during this time. We need a mass testing. We need a health insurance for people we need to absolutely look at this for the total crisis that it is and it is not going to come from this administration they have no interest in bringing it up it is a it's it's meaningless when you're basically trying to set, save democracy at this point 
COVID takes a backseat. And yeah, I think that's, that's, that's what's happening. Well, do you think the public agrees with our you know, thought that this should be higher in the priority list? Or is the public all confused about it? I mean, uh, you know, Trump has been brilliant in confusing the public about everything. Do you think the public really has a perception of what is going on with COVID? Well, I mean, I think since we live in Hawaii, we can only talk about what you, you, we can look at the rest of the world and, and see different things that are going on, but we're affected by it here. So we have to look at now no gatherings of five people. If you go to church, no singing. And these are common sense. Well, that's not what I'm talking about, really. It's that complacency thing. You know, if you ignore the subject and you have all these shiny objects, what you're really building is confusion. Oh, and as Tim said, no, no coherent policy. You're really building confusion. You're building chaos in the, in the public mind. Um, and you're building complacency, which well, I think that's, has happened. That's why we, and if you I, build well, complacency, it gets worse. Well, that's why we have had this new lockdown situation is because people have become complacent. And I went down to the beach a week ago before we started out, and there were a ton of people just all over each other, mostly young people, sorry to say. Um, I would say between 15 and 30. Um, and I, I don't know what the rationale is behind that because they're a fairly aware group, but uh, maybe they don't, I don't know what's behind that, but everyone's become complacent in it to some degree or another. Maybe not, maybe older people are more aware, but um, you know, the, what we, so the mayor has finally had to come out and say, all, we're in an emergency now. You can't go out anymore unless you're going for food or medicine or, uh, you know, just the, the few exceptions that are out there. You can't gather. We are going to be very rigorous in our enforcement. Um, so at a local level, if this is what it takes to wake people up and say, okay, it is not business as usual, folks. Uh, we need to respond like this. The, the other half of that coin, though, is it doesn't exist. There, what are you going to do if you don't have the job? Where's the money coming from? It's not there. So, oh. well, you, and for that matter, where the, where is the health care coming from? You know, one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is um, if you don't have a job and you don't have health insurance and there's no money coming from Washington, which is actually the case, um, then, you know, what happens when you get COVID? What happens when you, you hear it you in know, Hawaii? Hospital. We're okay. In Hawaii, we're okay because you can go get free medical care. Actually, at, at certain healthcare uh, centers, uh, regardless of income to pay. So mm. I think we're we're different here than in the mainland. But okay. uh, yeah. mainland uh, then, uh, Waikiki Health will take you at what? regardless of your ability to pay. It's a federally qualified healthcare center, and you know we were a model for a long time. And we have to remember, like uh, when our friends in the mainland say, "Oh, and I got health insurance." my job well we've had that for a long time here even if you don't have a job you should be covered to some degree now will you be able to live in the place where you've been renting probably not when you have very high rates of people not being able to pay their rent uh even in june and july it's only going to get worse Cynthia, now. So you wouldn't, might have Cynthia, wouldn't you be terrified if you housing. didn't have insurance um and you and you and you had covid i mean would, would you know about the waikiki health center would what would you do there isn't a lot of um, exposure or advertising for that. And so you don't really know what to do. And I read an interesting article um, from The Atlantic that talks about the long-term effects of COVID. So past the stages of pneumonia and I need a ventilator. So you've recovered and now you're home and you've got tremors, you've got brain fog, you've got digestive problems, you've got clotting problems. There's so many other things that come from this disease that we don't know about. And these people are just kind of getting forgotten. They're just kind of dropping through the, the cracks. So now they're having to form their own groups to talk to each other. And it started actually in a different country even. And so now it's finally starting to spread here in the United States. But there are thousands and thousands of people that are still dealing with this disease, even though they're not in the acute stages anymore. Yeah. And I, that's an important place where we need to start making some studies and getting some official studies going so we can learn more about this disease. Well, it's interesting you, you say that because I don't know how many of you I circulated this to, but I got, a, um, I got an email from a doctor in Canada um, and he laid out 
uh, the lessons that the medical community has learned about how to how to deal with COVID. In other words, the hospital experience, um, what what um, palliative drugs are helpful, uh, what what treatments, what techniques the nurses and healthcare workers would use to make the patient more comfortable. And ventilators seem to be out these days. In fact, I had I saw one article for the proposition that all the trouble with the lungs had to do um, with um, with uh, clots, microscopic clots, and they have learned to use blood thinners. Now this is you know it's this is like um, um, it's ad hoc. It's not generally known or distributed. I don't know whether the healthcare community in general in the world. <laughs> is circulating this kind of <clears throat> information. But clearly, the hospitals have learned and the stats should be better. However, Stephanie, what is your prediction for the next month or two or three in terms of deaths? We're, what are we, 170,000 now? Uh, are we going to hit, uh, did I say, yeah, 170,000? Are we going to hit 200,000 by election day, by the end of the year? How fast is it going? I and mean, people don't really concentrate. You know, after a while, you, as as uh, Cynthia said, you you get numb. You get numb to the numbers. You know, my 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 old remark is, why don't we stop the show now and count to one hundred and seventy thousand, just to demonstrate how many people that is. Fact is, I calculated this. It would take one week, twenty four by seven, to count to that number. Okay, what do you think, uh, Stephanie? We're going to do between now and election day well i think it's going to get a lot worse and it's because the chaos is going to continue and uh there's no policy just like you say we don't know the beginning here's the beginning here's the middle here's the next part and here's the other part at the end and then here's the extended part and well, where's the research across all of those different segments of this disease where are they pumping out the findings as soon as they have some that are evidence-based and um at a high level confidence where nothing th this is the point about again saying there's no leadership and that um we're just like kittens running around uh you know with every feather that you put in our face we're running off after that so i you know and so there's no uh way that it can get better <laughs> and if uh, we get to the election and we have a change of administration, that's our hope. We, because then we will feel the surge of a framework coming in uh, that will shape how we go forward. Well, wouldn't you we be worried forward. we'll have, as we get closer to the election, we'll have, yes, we'll have a, a huge increases in the number of cases and deaths, but we'll also have okay. a huge increase in the number of shiny objects. Agreed. Which, Agreed. which one will we Agreed. be faced with? No. But Tim, we haven't talked okay. about the economy. We haven't talked about how this is affecting the economy. Uh, and it's hard to get your hands around that because we know that uh, the government is and will continue to close things down, uh, except in Denmark, maybe. Um, and you know, we're going we're gonna to have a, a, a continuing decline of our economy. This has got to hurt people. They can't eat. And when people can't eat, they are like unpredictable and they're unhappy and God knows what they'll do. What do you think about the economy? What do we know about the economy, both locally and nationally? Well, I, I think Donald Trump, again, using this, the shiny object, says the economy is great because guess what? The NASDAQ, the S&P, the Dow, they're at all time highs uh, before COVID. And therefore, the economy is doing great, completely ignoring unemployment, completely ignoring the loss of GDP, completely ignoring all the things that an economy relies on. Uh, so Donald Trump's, again, shiny object to distract us that you must be doing well. Look at your 401ks. You, you, you put your faith in the 401k. You put your faith in the Donald Trump. They'll put your faith in my vote. And so, but this is going to come crashing down. This cannot be sustained. And these numbers, the unemployment, the GDP, all these numbers are going to finally hit the economy or excuse me, the stock market, and it's going to come tumbling down. Why it hasn't come tumbling down bef before, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I just think that maybe Americans are going, hey, where can I put my money? I mean, I get one tenth of one percent on a CD that's safe, FDIC insured. I can't live on one tenth of one percent. So I am forced to put my money in the stock market and ride the risk train. And, and no one likes that. And at some point, it's, the train's going to come off the tracks. 
And the Fed doesn't have much room in its toolbox to keep funding 0% and uh, you know, throwing free money into the economy. I mean, you can get a 30-year fix at 2.5%. That's darn near free money. But what good is that money if, if no one has a job? So yeah. as far as the economy, I think, I, I think it's in a pretty um, precarious place. And I think, of course, locally, our economy's on the skids. Yeah. So let me ask you an unfair question. This, this crash in the market, when is it going to happen? Could you give us a day, for example? Yeah, November 4th. <laughs> I think you're right. You think it'll hold up. It'll hold up through election day because there are people out there, maybe remember, Trump supporters, that yeah. want to see it maintained till then. Remember, institutions are made of people. And the institutions are the corporations that are the institutional investors in the stock market. It's not the, it's not the mom and pop people that are, are, are floating this market, it's the institutions. Well, when the institutions have lost their fearless leader, they're gonna bail. And when they bail, it bails. Yeah. So Winston, you know, in, in the thirties, we had the depression. And I remember studying that in school and my first reaction is, what are they talking about depression? why the use of that term? What would Freud say about the use of the term depression? And, and I think that we have, to, we have to take a look at that term because it means that people get depressed. What do you think the public state of mind is these days? You can include your own. You can talk about mine if you want. <laughs> well, I mean, this, this is getting worse and how- uh, they... <laughs> he, uh, You know, People are fatigued. We've got corona fatigue. You talked about complacency before. But complacency is because people are getting exhausted. And I imagine that this is something like, like uh, you know, a long-term war or the depression or something where we've settled in now and we realize this thing isn't going away anytime soon. And we've got a whole bunch of bad news in front of us. No matter how, how if there's light at the end of the tunnel, a year down the road, a year and a half down the road, that's a year and a half down the road. So we've got to hold out hope for then. Well, people got to pay their rent right now. They got to go uh, get food right now. So naturally, uh, they can't see their friends. They can't hug their moms. You know, they're, they're naturally they're going to have uh, fatigue and exhaustion and depression. And if you're not, you're probably not doing Corona right because, uh, or you're doing it really right because you're so mindful that you're able to transcend it, which is great. And we all probably need to be meditating and praying more and all of that. But uh, I think that for most people, our normal social supports have been have been reduced or, or cut down. So these types of things where people can beam in and, and see like-minded people uh, sharing ideas, um, we have to rely on, on these electronic things. But it's also getting out. And you can talk to your neighbor six feet away and, and say, how are you doing? Do you need any milk? Um, you can still do all of those human things. Actually, the latest is 16 feet, but uh, I don't want to interrupt. 16 you. feet. You can you can yeah. yell at Mrs. Tanaka. You can you can call her on the phone too and say, "How are you doing?" I think but, people are pulling. But isn't isn't a population that is that. depressed? Isn't a population that is worried about the future a perfect opportunity for a dictator to emerge? Isn't that exactly what happened uh, with Hitler in Germany after World War One? He saw it as an opportunity oh, yeah, and he course. moved into it and he took power by reason of it. Well, I, I mean, that's a, Corona is just one more thing on to that list. So I don't, you know, this is just, we don't, I think as we go forward, everything will be dated, obviously pre and post 2020. Um, but we need to do the best that we can individually. I've mentioned this many times. We need to reach out on our own. We need to contact our friends, family, relatives, acquaintances, touch base, be a human as best as you can while we get through it together. Hey, let me move uh, on to healthcare. You know, one of the things that's clear, and this is happening even in Queens Hospital here in Hawaii, um, is that the, the beds that might be available for other illnesses and medical treatments are being are being taken by the COVID case. I, I heard that um, where Queens had two floors dedicated to COVID, now they have three. Uh, and so this is, this is a trouble. It means that if, if you have some other, and, and when we get older, in fact, in the normal course of human life experience, you, things go wrong, right? Um, it means that when you have some other non-COVID problem and you try to get into the, the health system, 
There's no room for you. Have we have we arrived at that yet, Cynthia? Or do you think we will arrive at it? We're very close. And in my own experience with being a patient, an inpatient at Queens, um, and when I was there, it was just two floors. Like you said, yeah, now it's a whole other floor. The floor that I was on no longer exists for regular patients like me. I mean, I needed those blood transfusions to survive. What do I do if I can't get them? Um, so it's a, it's a personal issue for me too, because it's scary when, you know, the whole beds are being just overwhelmed by COVID patients. And, you know, they're being very careful. And when they seal off those wards, you have to go through a clean room before you can come out of that ward and before you go into that ward. So as far as that goes, at least I'm really impressed with what Queens has done in regards to um, keeping it separate and really treating it like the deadly disease that it is. We owe them a debt of gratitude for sure, uh, yeah. that they, they really uh, have done a good job. So Stephanie, you know, uh, the election day is coming up. There are a lot of people who are afraid to go out to uh, to the polls physically. Um, on the other hand, they're also afraid uh, that, um, you know, that their vote might not be counted because of the machinations with, with the post office. Um, and, and I heard recently that the number of physical polls presently planned for Oahu, can you guess how many physical polls there will be right now in Oahu for the November 3rd election? One. Guess, two. two, two. That's roughly half a million you know, people each. in each one. Although if you're voting by mail, obviously eight. you're not in that, that formula. I mean, 500. But what about you? Are, are you gonna be concerned about going to a physical poll, maybe having to wait in line, maybe having to deal with a lot of people you don't, you don't know whether they've been exposed? Uh, are you gonna trust the mails? What is your current thinking about that and how might it change? Well, once again, Hawaii was very successful in the primary and they put all of their orange boxes out. So you didn't have to go to the very poll or uh, if you had your ballot, you didn't have to put it in the mail. If you're just not feeling confident about the mail, which might not be at that time, but right now I'm still thinking they're fixing it and we'll see what happens after the Congress gets more into it. But we put all those orange boxes everywhere. So you had a place you could go, which wouldn't require parking, walking, and all of that. And I say Hawaii is a model for that. And I mean, we, we're, we've had the chance to kind of step up here and do stuff really right and show it off. Yeah, but you'll have to agree with me that the government hasn't really done a good job here either. It's a well, scandal no, on testing. It's all scandal in scandal on the funding. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that the vets aren't getting their meds and people are and retireds are not getting their social security is horrifying. This sends more people into poverty. And this is I, I and I I'm not hearing enough range over this in the um, in the media. Um, it's there, but really not at a very, and this is exactly what led, you know, to the depression problem. I mean, we're going to have to start thinking about soup lines for all these people because we're, I there's think no we money. Already are. I think we are already are. We can remember no money's coming in. Uh, Trump's cockamamie proclamation didn't result in anything. And Congress is still locked up in the Senate. The Senate is still on vacation. There's no money coming in. People have no money to eat and various organizations are trying to give them soup kitchens. So I have one last question for you, Tim. Okay, this is also a hard question. Tim gets the hard questions. <laughs> we, we talked about, you know, uh, projecting how many cases we're gonna have in this country and, and for that matter in Hawaii. Um, but let's assume, it's a dark assumption. Let's assume that, that Trump is successful in creating chaos in, in the voting place. Uh, and that he's successful in calling the QAnons and, and the skinheads and the Second Amendment people to vote for him and, and screwing up the election to a fairly well so that either he wins or he is somehow able to retain power. Hard question, Tim. What will happen to COVID? It'll get worse. We he has gone from February 2020 to where we are today virtually doing nothing and he'll continue that policy because it doesn't serve him. And I, I believe that um, they will all be at 200,000 deaths well before December. 
and Donald Trump will treat it as if it was 15 deaths. He'll congratulate him, say, uh, himself by saying, see, it wasn't, it wasn't 2 million deaths, it's only 200,000 deaths. And he'll, he'll rationalize to himself, he'll rationalize to the nation, and unfortunately, 38 to 45% will take it in and believe it. And I don't believe COVID will get any better. Uh, the only thing that's going to get us out of this is an effective vaccine and or a possible treatment that prevents you from actually dying from COVID, but you're able to uh, be treated and you'll, you'll have it as a chronic condition until you get a vaccine. Let me throw one uh, interesting object uh, into the discussion before we close, and that is uh, Mexico. Uh, AMLO, you know AMLO, uh, Lopez Obrador. Um, he himself is uh, submitting to the, the trials of, of Putin's vaccine. And he is submitting Mexican people who would participate in those trials. God knows what's going to happen. <laughs> so why aren't Russians taking the Russian vaccine? Why aren't they engaged in the trials? <laughs> Good question, Tim. Why aren't the Russians taking it? They know better. <laughs> they don't want to end up like their opposition. Now he's been poisoned in his tea and he's now in a ventilator. They don't want to end up like that. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, Winston, good. Cynthia, Stephanie, Tim, thank you so much for this discussion. It really gets interesting and it will continue to get interesting and we really have to keep on this. It's very important to us and to the people we know and love and to the world in general. Thank you so much. Aloha. Aloha.